Usually when we think pirate boats, we think big sails, big cannons. You probably expect me to make a joke about the ship having a big stern XD. But as I've shown in previous videos, these large vessels were quite uncommon. They were hard to acquire, difficult to handle, and needed a large crew. Most pirates used a sloop, a one-masted sailboat. But what if I told you that a lot of pirates used something even smaller? Something along the size of a rowboat. Well, you'd think I was joking, and tell me that the pirates would get blown out of water before they could even plunder anything. In my opinion, the greatest sea battle involving pirates occurred in 1680, between three Spanish barks and a fleet of buccaneer canoes. A bark is a single-decked, two-masted sailboat that is good for rowing as well as sailing. These rounded cannons, whereas the buccaneers had only muskets in their canoes. And yes, by canoes I meant these little boats. Numerically, the Spanish counted 230, whereas the buccaneers were around 200, but one source says that only 60 of them partook in the battle. These men were distributed amongst the canoes, and each canoe could only carry 8 to 10 men. You might think that the battle would end up being a one-sided slaughter, the Spanish cannons blowing the canoes apart. Not quite. The buccaneers were ferocious fighters and excellent marksmen. They were able to kill the enemy crews, snipe their helmsmen, and destroy their sails. When the Spaniards were sufficiently damaged, the buccaneers boarded them and finished the job. Despite the small scale of this battle, it is likely one of the most documented and gruesome sea battles involving pirates. The buccaneers had 18 men killed and 34 wounded. At least one of their canoes had been destroyed. As for the Spanish, they had lost more than half their numbers. It was said that not one man was free from blood. But against all odds, the buccaneers had won. They went on to capture salt ships in the Panama Harbor, including a ship named the Blessed Trinity, the best sailor in the South Sea. And all of this was achieved, with only a bunch of rowboats. Now that I've explained why the rowboat shouldn't be underestimated, we can take a dive into the details of their construction. In this video I'll primarily discuss two crafts, the canoe and its larger cousin, the piragua. These small vessels were the most numerous in the Caribbean, since they were so cheap and easy to produce. Both had been used by Native Americans before European arrival, and had since been adapted by colonists and pirates. Both are often known as dugouts, because they are literally dug out of logs. First you need to find a good tree. Cedar was described as being the best, partly due to its resistance to worms. Natives often used a cotton tree, since it was easier to work with. The tree was cut down, its upper surface hewed flat, then rolled over and carved out. Thickness was judged by drilling holes, and then plugging them. The canoes were hollowed out by burning or carring with tools. Construction time varied. In one example, two craftsmen needed two weeks to build a piragua. At Boca del Toro, a group of filibusters needed three weeks to build their canoes from scratch. The result was a wooden hull with a flat bottom, a blunt or sharp stern, and a sharp prow that could cut the sea like a knife. The gunnels of the canoe or piragua were fitted with oar locks made from straps of manatee hide, onto which a pirate secured their oars. They likewise built them with forts. These are benches where the oarsmen can sit. Since natives didn't row, but paddled their canoes, they built them without forts. For steering, the canoe was equipped with a rudder or a paddle. Steering with a paddle ain't easy by any means. This simple construction allowed pretty much anyone to make them, including pirates. Many pirates were former baymen, lumberjacks who illegally harvested logwood in the Yucatan Peninsula. They were great at cutting down trees and making piraguas from them. But if the pirates couldn't be bothered to make their own canoes, they could always steal or purchase them. The best canoes were made by natives, who had been making them since recorded history. All of the canoes and piraguas used in the aforementioned bloody battle had been given by the Kuna tribe, who were frequent allies of buccaneers. Piraguas are essentially large canoes. Whilst it is sometimes called a piragua in English, or a periagua, uh, I prefer the Spanish word piragua. That was also the word most used by pirates, and it's kinda easier to say. It derives from the Carib word piragua. The French call them pirogues, or pirogues, I guess, uh, not to be confused with pirogues. Aside from pirating, the piraguas was used for fishing, turtling and trading, and some were large enough to carry 50 or 60 barrels. Since they carried small crews and no weapons, they made easy prey for pirates, 
and was likely one of the most common prizes. The piragua wasn't built that much different from a canoe, only that it was bigger. Again, size varied. Some canoes could carry 10 men, others carried 25. Some piraguas carried 30 men, others carried 120. The biggest piraguas were often called man of war piraguas. Piraguas were typically 10 meters long and 1.5 and meters wide. Each piragua carried 12 to 14 oars. What really differentiated them from the canoe, apart from size, was that the piragua was often rigged with one or two masts. Exquemelin described piraguas as having one mast with a single broadsail. However, other piraguas were known to have two masts with Bermuda sails, and some piraguas even carried topsails. Regardless of rigging, the light weight propelled by oars and sails made them very fast. Exquemelin called them Neptune's post horses. Piraguas could be fortified to make them more seaworthy. Henry Pittman wrote how one group of privateers added sideboards to their piragua, keeping the sea out and making it safer to sail in open waters. This would also have made for good cover in combat. Dampier described how Spanish piraguas were barricaded with bull hides breast high. Since canoes and piraguas lacked good cover, buccaneers had to crouch or lie prone in them when firing their muskets. The piragua was used extensively throughout the entire golden age of piracy. The age begins with the buccaneers on Tortuga, as they turned to piracy to avenge themselves on the Spanish. Legend says that the first attack was made by Pierre Le Grand, as he used the piragua to board the Spanish galleon. Henry Morgan used a fleet of barks, piraguas and canoes in transporting his army of buccaneers across the Spanish main. When Benjamin Hornigold started up the Pirate Republic on New Providence, he did so with, you guessed it, piraguas. They were even used by pirates in West Africa, such as John Leadstone. These boats had a lot of advantages. As said, they were cheap to make or otherwise easy to acquire. And as a pirate, you didn't really need anything else to perform reasonably well. Most merchants were poorly armed sloops with small crews, or even other piraguas, so a pirate fleet of canoes could easily overtake and capture them. And when push came to shove, like the battle in the introduction, the skill and tenacity of the buccaneers was often enough to win the day. If your goal was to attack a town or plantation, piragas were all you needed for transportation back and forth. Thanks to their size, they could sail up rivers, coasts and shallow waters. They were only unsafe for open oceans and deeper waters, but as aforementioned, some buccaneers fortified their sides and ventured out anyway. They could easily row against the wind if you wanted to chase down a target or escape. Due to their size, they could easily be concealed or carried ashore. If you had or acquired a bigger vessel, a canoe could be kept aboard or towed astern and then be used for carrying men and supplies ashore. Unlike the natives, Europeans fitted their canoes with thwarts and preferred to row them. Rowing was less exhaustive, faster and more men could row at once. Natives only paddled their vessels. This was more exhaustive but made much less noise. Thus. Buccaneers only paddled when performing a stealth attack. That brings me on to battles with piraguas. Preferably, you would scare the enemy into submission. Samuel Bellamy was an expert at this. His men would strip down, wave their weapons and start screaming as they rode towards the enemy. If push came to shove, the first goal was to suppress the enemy. Buccaneers trained their muskets on the gun crews, keeping the gun ports shut to prevent cannon fire. One cannon was sometimes enough to just blow a canoe apart. When suppression was achieved, they aimed to snipe the officers and helmsmen to cause confusion and prevent coordination. Their volleys were able to destroy sails and rigging, slowing the enemy down. This allowed their nimble canoes to outmaneuver them. They sailed up to the enemy's stern and wedged their rudder, completely stopping them. Finally, with a good volley, grenades and using smoke for cover, the buccaneers boarded and finished the fight. A piragua wasn't comfortable by any stretch of the imagination. They were small, narrow and of shallow depth, and pirates usually overcrowded them. Henry Morgan crossed Darien in 32 canoes, averaging 33 men apiece. Exquemelin writes that the buccaneers were almost crippled with lying too much crowded in the boats. Even being just one man in a canoe was uncomfortable. Nathaniel Erring wrote how he had to sleep with his head on the stern sheet, his back on a thwart, and his feet on the oar laid crosswise from gunnel to gunnel. There wasn't any space to keep anything other than your weapons and the most basic provisions. 
Muskets had their muscles plugged, their locks waxed and covered, and lashed together amidships. Provisions were kept in the fore. Some Piragua pirates might have eaten cooked food. We know that some native tribes built fire hearts in the middle of their canoes, and that one European sailor did so. However, we can assume that most pirates ate their provisions raw, cold, and spoiled by the water. Since they seldom went on long trips with Piraguas, we can presume that the food mostly consisted of cured meat and fresh fruit. Then there was the lack of shelter. The tropical sun was ruthless, but clever pirates could make a sun cover from a sail or a hammock. Henry Pittman wrote that We likewise made a tilt, with a hammock over the hinder part of our boat, to defend us from the scorching heat of the sun. The bigger problem was the sea itself. Pretty much every canoe had some problem with leakage. When Morgan's men sailed from Jamaica to Panama, they spent most of the time in drenched clothes, bailing out water with buckets and calabashes. As aforementioned, you could board up the sides to protect against the ocean, but there was nothing against the rain. The worst case was capsizing. When Sharp and Coxon crossed through Darien, the canoe carrying basalt ringroves got lost and was eventually overturned by the powerful sea. The author reports that the survivors swam for their lives. When they made it ashore, the canoe had tumbled after them. The weapons had survived, but all their food and fresh water had been ruined. Lastly, I'll talk about a more formal variant of the canoe and piragua, that being the ship's boat. Known as longboats, launches, yawls, pinnacks, and many other names, they were either towed by on a ship or kept aboard. They were used for landing troops, transportation, or even for pirating themselves. They were more similar to a piragua than a canoe, since they were outfitted with a mast and a large bank of oars. Additionally, they were often kitted out with civil guns or, or even cannons. Woods Rogers wrote that, We put both pinnacks in the water to try them under sail, having fixed them each with a gun, after the manner of a paderero, and all things necessary for small privateers, hoping they'd be serviceable to us, in little winds to take vessels. Since Rogers' fleet consisted of larger vessels, he wanted to use his more nimble and ore-powered pinnacks to chase down faster targets, in case of weak winds and such. These boats kitted out with swivels were called men of war, and there's even some incidents of piraguas being called man of war piraguas. So much for man of war meaning a big ship with a lot of cannons. Whilst the canoe and piragua were exclusively built in the Americas, the launch and ship's boat were more so the norm in Europe. When used for pirating, it was primarily by privateering expeditions, like that of Woods Rogers or George Shelbach. Large rowboats have been some of the most flexible and common pirate vessels, not only during the Golden Age, but the entirety of history. Similar crafts were used by the Vikings, Barbary pirates and Cossacks. In our modern day, Somali pirates resort to using small motorboats, essentially a 21st century piragua. They are cheap, fast, and usually enough to overpower weak merchants, or deliver you to a land location fit for plunder. Whilst they couldn't carry the most cargo or cannons, only a weak man blames his equipment. The resourceful pirate does whatever he can, with whatever he has available. He can't exactly afford to be picky. And despite the more money he saves, the more he can spend in the tavern. Huge thanks to my generous supporters over on Patreon. Cole Freer, Max Twig, 1660, Michael Jans, Gus Rowe, Rachel Lockgar, Dyer, Ted Levin, Flintlock, Red Hate, George Skull, and Part of Jesus. Don't forget to give the video a like and a comment to support the algorithm, and share the video with a friend. Cheers. Good shot, Squire.